Welcome to Gwinnett County Public Library's Community Conversations. Today's subject, legislative districting and election issues in Gwinnett. Our partner for this series is the Gwinnett Remembrance Coalition. I am Ron Goche and I am the Youth Services Community Partnerships Manager of the Gwinnett County Public Library. Before I introduce our moderator, I would like to cover a few housekeeping tips. First of all, this talk is being recorded and will be uploaded to the library's YouTube channel in about a month. Um, this is a webinar, so your mic and camera will be off, but we invite you to use the Q&A box to ask your questions. Our moderator will read those questions as time allows. Tonight's moderator is Dr. Paul Grant. He is an associate professor of political science in the School of Liberal Arts at Georgia Gwinnett College. He teaches American government, state and local government, and Georgia politics courses. His published and presented research topics include race, ethnicity, and politics, legislative studies, and state government and politics. Dr. Grant studied the social, political, and economic climate of South Africa 10 years after the end of apartheid on a Fulbright Hayes Fellowship. He is a member of the GGC Sustainability Committee and co-founder of the GGC Community Microphone. Dr. Grant, it's a pleasure to have you with us again tonight. Well, thank you, Ron. It's great to be back. Well, uh, this is the last of our um, discussions. Um, and I want to welcome everyone to a community conversation. Let me just kind of recap what we've done so far. So I think we've done some really fine work. Um, I want to call it this semester, but basically this, this season. Um, as you know, uh, this is being put on by the Gwinnett Remembrance Coalition uh, and the Gwinnett County Public Libraries. In January, um, our conversation was entitled Honoring Charles Hill. The program included Reverend Inger Williams, and she is the niece of Charles Hill, who was a victim of a lynching uh, on the Lawrenceville Courthouse Square back in 1911. Uh, she was joined by Ray Harvin and Steve Babb, members of the Gwinnett Remembrance Coalition. And the coalition is working with the Equal Justice Initiative to recognize victims of lynching and promote diversity and inclusion in Gwinnett County. In February, the program featured authors, Dr. James and Wandy Taylor, and their book entitled, The Imperfect Storm, Racism and a Pandemic Collide in America. Doctors Taylors gave an in-person talk uh, at the Lilburn Library branch on the challenges of racism and COVID-19 uh, for public school teachers during this time. In March, we examined Gwinnett Beyond the Numbers with Luke Wynn, a US Census Bureau data specialist. And Mr. Wynn discussed Gwinnett County demographics uh, and shared county data from the 2020 census and introduce census website data tools and explain to viewers how to use them. Last month, we discussed food insecurity and food deserts, uh, as well as urban farming in Gwinnett. And we were joined by uh, Lindsay Jorstad from Gwinnett County, Tim Daly from the UGA Cooperative Extension, and Lisa Engberg from Lawrenceville Cooperative uh, ministries food bank. So that brings us to this evening. And this evening, we're going to have, uh, basically have a program in which we discuss voting and election issues in Gwinnett County. After the 2020 election in which Democratic presidential candidate uh, Joe Biden won Georgia with less than 12,000 votes or by less than 12,000 votes, 
and two Democratic Senate candidates won Georgia as well. Um, considerable national attention was paid to Georgia by former President Trump, uh, the National Republican Party, and the press. Allegations made by the former president, the GOP, and the conservative press that the election was stolen in several states uh, with major metropolitan areas possessing large populations of people of color, uh, such as Philadelphia, uh, Milwaukee, and of course, uh, Atlanta, uh, led Republicans to implement election reforms to prevent election fraud, even as no evidence of election fraud was found. Republicans uh, in Republican controlled state legislatures passed laws reducing access to the polls in terms of early voting, drop boxes, mobile voting, and other limitations. Uh, Georgia was one of many states that introduced some of these limitations, and perhaps our panelists will speak to some of those tonight. Um, Gwinnett specifically had changes made uh, in its commission as well as school board districts in a manner that departed from traditional or Georgia tradition in matters of local decision-making. And again, the panelists will speak to that one as well. Um, so it gives us some questions, right? How will these changes affect Gwinnett County voters? Will they be pleased? Will they be confused, discouraged, energized? To get these answers, um, we're gonna ask our panel of election experts tonight, and I'd like to go ahead and introduce them. Diane Fisher is president of the League of Women Voters of Gwinnett, a nonpartisan political organization engaged in broad educational efforts, as well as advocacy. She is committed to ensuring, ensuring that every person has the desire, the right, the knowledge, and the confidence to participate in our democracy, especially via the vote. She also serves on the steering committee of the Gwinnett Remembrance Coalition. In her professional life, Diane is an independent educational consultant assisting students and their families to understand and navigate the college admission experience. Diane, I'll be calling you in a couple of years. Uh, she holds an AB degree from Colgate University and a Master's of Arts degree in education from Harvard University. Welcome, Diane. We also have Mr. Stephen Day and uh, Mr. Day is a former president and current member of the Gwinnett County Board of Registrations and Elections. Mr. B Mr. Day is in his 10th year of service on the Gwinnett County Board of Registrations and Elections. Um, Stephen serves, Stephen is a Metro Atlanta native and currently resides in Decula, Georgia, right here in Gwinnett County. He is a former two-term chairman of the Gwinnett Democratic Party and a member of the Georgia Democratic Party's State Committee. Stephen is a graduate of the uh, Georgia Institute of Technology, Georgia Tech, uh, and is the owner of Day Energy LLC, a biomass brokerage and consulting company. And welcome, Stephen. Thank you. Just a clarification, we call sure. them chairs rather than presidents of the election board. Minor I'm sorry, they're called, I'm sorry, what, what is the correct title? Uh, chair or chairperson of the board. Okay, I appreciate that. No Thank problem. you for the correction. We are also joined by Zach Manifold. Zach Manifold was appointed Gwinnett County election supervisor by the Board of Elections in 2021. He is responsible for the management and day-to-day -day operations of the Voter Registration and Elections Division. 
Zach is an innovative and experienced administrator who works in a nonpartisan manner to run fair, open, accessible, and secure elections for county residents. He received a bachelor's degree in political science from the Ohio State University in 2004. I won't hold that against him. I went to Wisconsin. We talked about that. Uh, and in 2013, he became a certified elections registration administrator through the National Association of Election Officials um, Election Center uh, at Auburn University. Zach and various, uh, Zach has had various uh, previous election administration experience, having served as Franklin County Board of Elect, on, I'm sorry, having served the Franklin County Board of Elections in Columbus, Ohio, as a board member, um, manager of absentee and early voting, and interim director. And welcome, Zach. Thank you. Great to be here. Great to have you. And last but not least, uh, from the same uh, department in Gwinnett County, uh, we have Kareem Briscoe. And Kareem is an elections coordinator for Gwinnett County a Board of Voter Registrations and Elections. Mr. Briscoe began working with voter registrations and elections as a poll official liaison in October 2017. He was hired in 2018 as an elections associate too. His work experience with Gwinnett Elections includes election day and advanced in-person staffing for all polling locations. He has also worked with election staff to assist with day-to-day -day street research and redistricting for Gwinnett County residents. Kareem also manages the logistics and accuracy process for all voting equipment for the 2000, uh, or managed for the 2020 presidential election. He was promoted to outreach and educations coordinator in 2020. His team handles open record requests and sorting of retention and also promotes voter registration and poll official recruitment throughout Gwinnett County. Kareem received a bachelor's degree in sports management from University of West Georgia in 2006, which seems fitting, and I had to, I had to throw this in, in part because um, it appears that elections and politics have become a blood sport. So having a background perhaps in uh, sports management <laughs> might be fitting. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so some of y'all got to choke there. Well, Thanks for having me. I'm glad to have you. Thank you for joining us. Well, welcome everybody to this, uh, this last program. And like I said, I, I hope we've been informative throughout um, you know, the winter and into the spring. Let's go ahead and talk about some of these election issues and hopefully uh, what we do tonight will be helpful to voters in Gwinnett County. Um, Diane, is it okay if I start with you? Sure. Great. So um, the League of Women Voters has been around for a long time and we always associate elections and especially debates with the League of Women Voters. Um, can you tell us a little more about what the league does and you know how and why it was founded and what you guys are doing in Gwinnett? Sure, sure. So the League of Women Voters is a um, citizens organization that has fought since 1920 to improve our government and engage citizens in the decisions that impact their lives. We operate at a national level, at a state level, and at local levels um, in more than um, 
800 state and local leagues in all 50 states, as well as DC, the Virgin Isle Islands, and, um, and also Hong Kong, in fact. Um, <laughs> so we were formed from the movement to secure the right to vote for women. Uh, the centerpiece um, of the league's efforts remain to be expanding participation and giving a voice to all Americans. So we've been around since again, 1920. Our issues are grounded in our respect for history and in making democracy work for all citizens. So the league is nonpartisan, which means that we don't support or oppose candidates for public office. However, we are known for hosting candidate debates and forums. Um, and we undertake this work and other important election work because we deeply believe that the public should hear different views on issues facing our communities and our nation. Um, and that honest, respectful sharing of ideas is sort of what is important to a, a functioning democracy. Here in Gwinnett, um, the league has come and gone over many, many years. Uh, in 2019, uh, a group of us recreated, uh, re-established the, the uh, league here in, um, uh, in Gwinnett. Um, and we started sort of making ourselves known and, and having programming. Um, and then for the past really two years since, since COVID, uh, we have done all of our uh, programming online, including uh, candidate forums and uh, discussions. Uh, we work very closely with uh, the Board of Elections and Registrations to get out information um, because we really do believe that the best, uh, you know, an informed voter um, is an engaged voter. Um, and so we do work to make that happen so that that folks know how to vote, where to vote, what to, you know, not so much who to vote for, but who is uh, available on their ballot to, to vote. And so we engage with that kind of work. That's great. Excellent. Um, what are some priorities or concerns related to voting that might be specific to Gwinnett County? So I think that the issues that are um, that we are concerned with is again that that people have information um, about uh, the changes. We we work to to make sure that um, good policy and practice is in place. Um, we have an observer corps which is at the board of elections meetings, so that we're you know watching what goes on um, at at those meetings. We participate actively in that process, but it really is important that voters know what those changes are that are going on um, and know what the rules are as they, they change. Um, I, I like to say that voters are creatures of habit. Um, what they did in the last election, they believe is what they've always done in every election and should do in every election forward. So every time something changes, whether it's a polling location or what they need to bring to the polls or where what the hours of the polls are or Dropbox changes. Anytime it's a change, um, it, it makes it more difficult for people to, to, to vote because they, um, they do tend to sort of think that it, it always stays the same. Um, and as changes unfold, it becomes more and more difficult for folks to get the information that they need. So um, that I think is in, in my estimation, what, you know, pushing out the information um, to the greatest uh, number of people possible so that they have the tools that they can um, use to, to exercise their right. Okay. And I'm curious if someone wants to join the League of Women Voters. Um, how does that happen? So I will drop a link okay. in, in the uh, chat. And I, and I was um, going to ask. I'm sorry, I will no, drop a link gonna... in the chat. Um, we okay. do have a Facebook page um, where we and a mailing list um, uh, where we do push out information about uh, elections and, and so on. And we certainly always encourage um, folks to join us as members um, and engage with the work that we're doing. Another big thing that we are very engaged with is voter registration, uh, making sure that that people are registered so that they actually that's the first step um, in being a voter is you actually have to register um, first. So I'm always looking for people to, to help with that, that effort as well. And I will drop a link in the chat uh, um, in just a bit. I appreciate that, Diane. And I also wanted to add, you know, since I teach college, um, do you have any special programs or opportunities or internships for college students? 
Um, we don't specifically have um, those kinds of things. I mean, we, we, we engage with a lot of young people, um, whether they are uh, college students or actually high school students, um, engage with you know, high school students, working with, uh, with folks to, um, to register them to vote, to educate their, uh, their folks. So there are lots of opportunities to get involved and happy to, to uh, reach out to anybody or talk to anybody who might wanna get involved with electoral work. Okay, well, I appreciate that. And we'll probably circle back with some more questions for you. But thank Absolutely. You. Um, Stephen, have uh, some questions for you that hopefully people will find informative in terms of the answer. Um, and we've alluded to some of the changes that have happened um, in Gwinnett County uh, with polling places moving um, and other changes. Uh, but before we talk about those, and I know that you're prepared to discuss that, um, can you tell me just what's the responsibility of the Gwinnett County Board of Registrations and Elections? Be glad to. The Gwinnett County Board of Registration and Elections is made up of five people. There are two appointed by each of the two major political parties. The two Democrats, two Republicans, and then the four of us select a fifth at large member. Under the law, our primary function is to hire the election supervisor, Zach Manifold in this case, and to also pick uh, polling places. And that's what explicitly said in the law. We also advise the staff in regards to issues such as the hours of early voting, uh, policies about how we process uh, challenges, for instance, that's one we've been looking at closely. And so we're basically kind of a advise and consent board. Uh, but the two things that are really explicitly spe uh, specified in the enabling legislation is the hiring of the supervisor and the picking of election precincts and polling places. And uh, just as a note, our chairmanship rotates every two years among the members of the board. We rotate political parties, goes to the, the independent, goes back around again. So every two years we have a new chair. Our current chair is uh, Alice Olenek, uh, the Republican, and she's been on the board even longer than I have. Uh, she's almost in her 11th year now. I also want to ask, as I always want to ask, you know, how do people get involved? If someone actually wants to be on this board, um, what's the process? How is the board structured? What the well, as I said, the, the board is a four out of five members of the board are political appointees. The chair <laughs> of each of the political parties involved nominates someone and then their local county committees vote to uh, approve that appointment. And uh, so basically uh, for four out of the five positions, you need to be involved in your respective political party in a way enough where they respect your opinions and that you would represent uh, not just their political viewpoint, but would be open-minded enough to look out for all the voters of Gwinnett County and serve all the voters in Gwinnett County. And the fifth member is usually someone that has been active in the community in some form or fashion and who is respected by both parties and we feel like could serve in a, uh, a properly in an open-minded fashion. Mm -hmm. And you've kind of alluded to my next question or uh, subject or topic in terms of, you know, given the fact that the board is partisan, with the exception of that one person, um, you know, what do board members do or what do you feel they should do to make sure that um, elections are free and fair? And, and, and Let me back up and say that. Sure. I, I would say that all the board members try not to get into the partisan aspect of things. And, and I'm gonna say, I mean, I've had some headbutting sessions with some of our my colleagues on the other side of the political spectrum. But at the end of the day, especially from the process standpoint, uh, we tend to be in agreement. We're trying to make things that are efficient and open and accessible and with some exceptions, there have been some votes in the past where there were disagreements among the Republicans and the Democrats about, for instance, early voting times on Sunday or uh, uh, maybe during the runoff in 2001. 
about how long to have early voting, those sorts of things. But for the most part, most of the votes we have are non-contentious. They're mostly about processing. If Zach or Kareem want to jump in on that and give their opinion, if they disagree, please feel free to do so. But I, I will say this too, and, and like I said, I've had some serious disagreements with our chair, but I'm going to, in defense of her in regards to the 2020 race, I never ever heard one peep out of her in regards to challenging the results. She always spoke uh, in defense of our staff and the way that they conducted the election and has done so since. Though so she has never said anything uh, otherwise, at least in my, in my conversations uh, with her. So, and her colleague as well. So I just wanna uh, say that we do try to be as nonpartisan as we can and have the best interest of Gwinnett citizens at heart. Thank you, Stephen. Now, I understand that you have a, a, a very good kind of historical perspective of some of the changes in the I, I do have districts. a quick PowerPoint, if you allow me to share it, if we can. Do yes. That shows yes, you're the welcome to do so. The progression of voting in the county and of uh, registration. And let me see if I can get that up. There's the title, Gwinnett Registration Changes Demographics and Impacts on Redistricting. This, what you're looking at right now, is from 1994 governor's race. And this, the blackened precincts are the handful of precincts that went Democratic in 1994 governor's race for Zell Miller. And, and I'll just let everybody, anybody that's watching this, because I'm a Democratic, Democratic appointee, my statistics are from that point of view. I'm not trying to advocate. That's just the data that I have in hand in my files to show. So that's 1994. This is 2020. This is the blue represents precincts. Biden carried the red or it represents precincts that Trump carried. And those that you see with red outer with blue in it, those are precincts that uh, went from being Republican in 2018 when uh, Kemp was running against Abrams that actually went to Biden in 2020. So there was another oh, hmm. about 18 or so 19 precincts that transitioned from Democratic to Republican, I mean, from Republican to Democratic from mm -hmm. 2018 to 2020. And you would say, well, why, uh, how can you go from that to this in a period of 26 years? All right, uh, bear with me, but look at this, this chart mm -hmm. here in the upper quadrant. This is 1990, 96% of the voters in Gwinnett County are white. That's 145,000 out of 151,000. You can see uh, four years later, that was dropping a little bit, a, little, a few more uh, percentage points as growth started happening in the county. But here's 12 years later, you see that the percentage of the white registration dropped by about 15 points. It's still increased by mm -hmm. about 50,000 voters, but you see the African-American went up about six or seven times to almost 30,000 voters. And you can see that uh, Asian and Latino voters are starting to show up on the radar screen. I actually mm -hmm. would challenge this numbers a little bit. I, I would imagine a, a certain number of them were in this other category. Mm -hmm. And at that time, there were 241,000 voters. And I'm showing this off to the side about, once again, from a Democratic perspective, what the vote was at that time. See, uh, Governor Roy Barnes uh, got almost 37% of the vote in Gwinnett County with this Democratic, I mean, demographic makeup mm -hmm. in the county. Now, if you look over time, here's 2010, 2012, you can see that, oops, excuse me, you can see the drop in the percentage of the white registers and the increase in African-American, the increase in Asian and Latino. And interestingly enough, just as a side, the Latino and, and Hispanic, excuse me, the Asian and Latino uh, registration rates have been paralleling each other for decades. And again, you can see with each election that it looks like that the results didn't change that much, even though the demographics did until you get to 2016. And then the white percentage of the vote is below 50%. And uh, obviously the, the non-white percentages have all gone up. You can see that Clinton got a little over 50% of the vote. You can see that the average, the registration rate mm -hmm. has gone up to about 431,000. And uh, there are other reasons why the 
the their political reasons why the vote went the way it did. Candidates matter. People, there are people that change from Republican to Democrat. It's not locked into stone. So sometimes you can have a candidate that will do better than maybe the projections might indicate. But by 2018, and this is really interesting to look at, you went from 430,000 registered active voters to 525,000, almost a uh, uh, 95,000 vote increase. Mm. And with that, you can see the percentage of the uh, white electorates continuing to decline and a gradual increase in all the non-white um, sectors of the electorate. And you see that Abrams got uh, over 56% of the vote there. And to sort of cut to the chase, if you want to take a 20-year look, go back to 2002 with 241,290 voters to 2022, the 1st of May of this year, the difference between those, those registration rates is 320,000 voters. Well, if you come over here, the numerical increase of that increase, less than 6% was white. And you can see the increase 124,000 African-American, uh, 57,000 Asian, 53,000 Latino, 67,000 others. So out of that 320,000 increase, 302,343 were non-white voters. Basically, the number of white voters has remained almost stagnant for the last 10 years or so, whereas most of the increase in the registered voters in the county have come from non-white voters. And you're saying, well, if people make up their minds, why does that matter? And I would say one day we may get to the point where ethnicity and political uh, persuasions, uh, pers political attitudes aren't uh, correlated, but right now they are. African-American voters tend to vote uh, anywhere between 80 to 92% Democratic. Asian mm -hmm. voters somewhere between uh, 55 and 70%, depending on the election. Uh, Hispanic voters, the same situation. So there is a correlation that's got a Democratic bias to it with non-white voters, whereas, of course, white voters have a bias toward Republicans. That bias uh, from a Democratic perspective, I know those percentages, they are, you know, white voters tend to vote in Georgia, anywhere between about 20% Democratic to about 30% Democratic, depending on who the candidate is and the race. And just as a footnote on that, uh, Stacey Abrams got 25.5% of the white vote in 2018 and still lost by 55,000 votes, and Biden got 29.5% of the white vote in 2020 and won by a little less than 12,000 votes. So that's some perspective on that. And uh, and how does that affect districting? Well, this is, if you'll take a quick look, this was on the left is the Board of Commissioners uh, original map. In the middle is the black voting age population map for the county. You can see the population, the concentration of voters. The, the dark blue is the highest, the middle, the light blue is sort of between 50 and 80% African-American precincts, and then the red is 20 to 50%. You can see the concentrations. And you can see the proposed uh, uh, Republican map is, again, it's got less of a concentration of African-American voters, strictly from a statistical, I'm not talking about value judgments here, but based on the way people vote, uh, understand why they proposed the map the, the way they did. Look at the Hispanic vote. You can see the same concentrations of Hispanic voters that cuts across what the Board of Commissioners proposed. Mm -hmm. And then again, what Republicans proposed. And here's the same thing for the Asian voters. Now the Asian voters are closer to the, uh, actually I call it sort of close to the river up this way, mm -hmm. uh, scattering down through the middle south uh, western part of the county. But again, there's still more of a concentration in, in these districts as the Republicans propose their new map. And this is, this is uh, again, I have to qualify, this was from a Democratic presentation. So, mm -hmm. you, you know, uh, there's a bias built into this, this data here. Not a bias in the data, but a bias of the people that were pre presenting it. So this was the current map. This is what the, the county commissioners proposed, and it really wasn't that much different from the current map, if you look at it. And then this is what the Republicans proposed uh, toward the end of the, well, in the session. And this is actually what got approved. This is what, again, the current map, 
which isn't that much different from what the, the Board of Commissioners proposed. And this is the new map that the state legislature did approve. And as a comment on that, uh, normally there's this thing called legislative courtesy where local uh, legislation, as long as the uh, majority of the delegation endorses it of your state reps, state senators, state senators, it usually gets passed, but the party in power, whether it's Democratic or Republican, can intervene and uh, overturn that. And that's, in fact, what happened here, that the Republican majority at the uh, General Assembly decided that they preferred this map that had been submitted to them. That's politics. I'll be honest, as a Democrat, back when Democrats were in control over 20 years ago, uh, they did the same thing. So this is the matter of who's in power and who has the ability to do what they want to do. Now, uh, this is the Board of Education Districts. You can see this was the current map and this was the one that was passed by the legislature. There's really not much difference. And there's a political reason because this is a Republican held district. This is a Republican held district. And I think that the powers that be that were making these decisions decided that was about as good as they were going to do. And, and they pretty much kept the maps as they were. This is the new congressional districts. I showed the, this larger view just so you can see how the districts expand into other uh, counties. Here's the new seventh. The ninth district comes down and takes a portion of Gwinnett and the sixth district takes a little tiny portion of Gwinnett. This is that same thing blown up just for the county. You can see it again. This is, this is a little harder to see, but these are the state uh, house districts and basically across here as you saw with the county commission districts this is republican territory through here most of these districts are going to go republican then the, the most of the rest of these are going to be democratic but you can see how the process of redistricting that that a district that might be in play otherwise is bled over into a more republican county so that they can hang on to it same thing here and mm -hmm. that's been going on. Democrats did the same thing when we were in power <laughs> downtown. So this is nothing new about the way these maps are drawn. Uh, this is the state Senate districts. And this is a Republican district. It's been shifted over a little. It used to be this way. Now, this 48 used to be a Democratic district, used to come in down here. and was pushed back up into more Republican territory. It still might eventually be in play, but that is probably going to be a Republican district. These are Democratic districts down through here. And uh, that's pretty much it. So let mm -hmm. me uh, stop the share. Mm -hmm. And and that's just a quickie version of what's what happened in redistricting in the county and the reasons for it. And again, uh, there is a correlation between uh, racial ethnicity and voting patterns, ergo the way these districts are drawn. Mm -hmm. Especially that pattern is especially true in the South. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and I think, I think Diane, uh, yep. do you have a map you want to share? I, so I actually just dropped in a link into the, um, into the chat um, from the, the county website uh, that has, you can pull up all of the district maps so you can take a look as Steve was going through them pretty quickly. Um, and I would just like to make one comment about um, the notion of, of how redistricting happens. Right now it is done by the legislature. And, and so uh, there is a push that whoever is in power has the power to um, do things. And as Steve said, you know, bad, bad players on both sides of the aisle when it comes to, to that. And so one of the things that the league is pushing for and there is a, a movement afoot is, is nonpartisan um, um, redistricting um, commissions uh, so that it takes the politics out of drawing the lines um, and uh, and it takes uh, you know it allows um, some of these things to be tapered um, down some and that is something that um, the league works on as and will be continuing to work on uh, hopefully for um, 2000 and uh, the, the redistricting that'll happen in 10 years in 2030. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good to know um, because, uh, you know, Steve was, you know, he was on point. Um, both parties do severe gerrymandering given the opportunity. And there's always a question of, you know, it's benefiting the parties and it's benefiting, of course, the incumbents. 
uh, but is it really benefiting the voters? So that continues to be an issue that I think we'll be discussing, uh, not just at, you know in the academy, but uh, out in the real world where people look at whether or not um, you know it's really making their vote matter. So this is a very important point to raise. Dr. Grant, can uh, I have a quick comment on that? The Supreme Court's basically stepped aside on the issue of gerrymandering, as I'm sure you're well aware. That yes, I am. Can, and just said it's a political issue. We're not going to deal with it. And the way the law is, unless it's overt racial gerrymandering, and usually that means taking a district that's 50% plus in a particular uh, ethnic category and diluting that below 50%, then uh, there's not much uh, anyone can do from a legal standpoint, at least as I understand mm -hmm. the current uh, legal decisions that have happened in, in the various courts. Now, you may mm -hmm. have a different interpretation, but that's my basic interpretation of, of mm -hmm. gerrymandering and redistricting. Mm -hmm. And that is about where we are, at least for now. But uh, there are some efforts I know in some states where they're trying to make them um, less partisan and make it more of an uh, uh, objective process of trying to draw district boundaries. So we'll see. Uh, I'm sure some states, you know, they, they used to teach this in state and local, so perhaps the moralistic states will be more engaged in trying to do this, but uh, time will tell. Um, well, speaking of how all these things actually affect real people and real voters. Let's now turn our attention to what's happening at the Gwinnett County Board of Voter Registrations and Elections. And uh, we have Zach Manifold with us and Kareem Briscoe. And I'm not sure who wants to take this question, but you all can decide between yourselves. Um, outline the process for preparing for an election. Uh, what are some of the things that the Board of Voter Registrations and elections does, and especially those things that you all are doing that the public just isn't aware that makes an election run so well that it's boring, right? It's just a boring election. People just go and do it. It's just routine. So when elections really go well, what are you all doing that we don't see that really makes these things work well? All right. Uh, well, thanks again for the invitation. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, yeah, a, a lot of, and it's been a pretty boring first week of uh, uh, advanced in-person voting, which always feels good for us because that means everything's kind of working and, 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 you know, we're working out. It's been almost 18 months since the county host, you know, ran uh, an election. So it, it's good. To, this is a good kind of first test run under the new rules and the new laws to kind of get us reacquainted to to what we do and making sure that we're prepared and ready for you know when we do have that large turnout coming for this fall um you know a lot of we do a lot of things i it's always funny to me people are like oh what do you guys do the rest of the year um in elections <laughs> we are super busy for for yeah. most of the year we it has been a busy i tell everybody it's been a busy four months getting to may we you know we had uh redistricting to start we, you know, we're the ones that actually have to go through and reassign, you know, reassign those 620,000 registered voters in Gwinnett um, between active and inactive. We have to go through and, and assign you to correct all your different districts from Congress all the way down to your, to your board of education races. And so we go through that, you know, that's reassigning 620,000 voters in our system. And we did that in about uh, like a week and a half process. It was a very tight window this time because of how late the maps got approved. But we, you know, our team works really hard whatever hours they got to do to get, get the work done and be on time. And, you know, then March 7th kicks in and, you know, we had that week and a half. And then on March 7th, everybody had to qualify for office the week of March 7th. So we, we also do all the candidate qualifying for local for the local offices, some go with parties. We do the nonpartisan races, the judges, um, and the school board. You know, they they come through our office and qualify. So you know, we do qualifying. We do you know voter registration all the way up to the deadline. April twenty fifth was the the last day to get registered for the upcoming primary. So you know, we're busy 
getting all those voter registrations in all the way up to the deadline. And then we switch over immediately to absentee the same day that is voter registration deadline. Absentee by mail ballots started going out April 25th. So the same day uh, yeah. we start we started mailing absentee ballots by mail. So and then, and then after that, you know, last that last Monday, um, May 2nd, we started advanced in person voting. And so you yeah. can go to any of the 11. There's the main we have 11 locations around the county that you can vote in person advance uh, before election day. We, we, we're going to go from May 2nd till May 20th. It's 19 straight days of mm -hmm. voting from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. So come on out and see us at one of those 11 locations. You can get it on our website at QuinetteElections.com. But basically, it's here, here at the main office. You can always come to the main office or one of our 10 satellite locations. Um, one of the changes this year is uh, you know, the drop boxes, if you want to return your, your absentee uh, by mail ballot at one of the drop boxes, we, we do have six drop boxes. So make sure you go on, on the website. They, they are all located at one of those 11 uh, app advanced in-person locations. So go, if you're looking to return your absentee ballot, make sure you go on the website and check out which spot to go to. They are only available this time. Because of the law change, they're they're inside one of those locations, and they're also only available during voting hours from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. So, uh, and I always like to mention our commissioners have been really great about investing in our office and, and investing in elections, and so we are prepaying postage on absentee ballots. So you do not have to come and do a drop box if you don't want to. You can always just uh, put that ballot in the mail. And you do not owe any postage on it. It is the county is paying for prepaid postage on the, on the return ballot, so you can always mail it back to us. Um, so that's an option, you know. And then we get into so after advanced in person ends on May twentieth, we get it. We get into election day. Um, you know, we're busy testing currently. We have a, what we call logic and accuracy testing go, testing going on for election day. All the equipment that's going out on election day is currently being tested. Uh, basically, you know, we're, we're working 12 hours a day testing all the voting equipment. Uh, we test every every ballot type, every 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 uh, you know every race. We pick every different position, and all those different totals have to have to add up to the same amount. So we're making sure that no matter what machine you're on, no matter who you select, that your ballot you know is accurate and, and comes back the way that you pick. Uh, so that that's all going on the logic and accuracy testing. I, I always tell people you can go on the website and find out. We post it on there of where you can come to to watch it. I know Stephen always says it's it's like watching paint dry, but it's an important part of our process. It really is. It means that your your ballot is going to get counted the way you want it to get counted. Um, so that's a really important process. Might might not be the most exciting thing to watch, but you can always come out and see our our staff going through those processes. They are long and tedious, but, but they are very important to give you, uh, you know, that, that uh, security that, that your, your vote will count. Well, Zach, let me, let, let me interrupt you for a minute because I, I wanted to ask Kareem because I believe he's uh, a staff person who's kind of more on the ground and in the field. Is that correct? I was going to say, he does all the outreach. He's yeah. the one out there talking okay. to Okay. Kareem, what are you seeing out there? Um, what are some of the things that you're looking out for that you're concerned about? Um, you know, we talked about how districts have changed and probably polling places have moved and people don't know what district they're in. Um, what are you seeing? How, how is that going in terms of helping voters find out what they need to find out? Well, from an outreach standpoint, um, we're responsible for providing those updates as they come in. So as, as Zach mentioned, you know, I'm on the front end a lot of times with our team and a lot of the citizens of Gwinnett want to know about the changes. So we provide, we provide news flashes. We provide updated literature. Um, we provide presentations upon request. So uh, most recently we had a 
outreach event at the Duluth Arts Festival. And you had a lot of voters that were unaware that advanced in person began on May 2nd. So there, there are questions like that that occur. When, when is the next election? Um, how much are poll official positions paying? You know, if we have changes in this different stipends, um, if we have different polling locations that are being added, polling locations that are being removed, those are the type of things that are being asked from an outreach standpoint, um, you know, I spoke at a senior matters event a while back and they wanted to receive updates about the absentee by mail applications. How do I turn them in? When are the deadlines? Things of that nature, just dates, important dates, election material, and just how do we actually process all of these things? So from an outreach standpoint, it's just about staying up to date and providing that accurate information. We also, too, I know you mentioned um, the word boring, but you know, last year in 2021, we had 59 outreach events um, throughout the county. So as Zach mentioned, pre-election and post-election, we're constantly getting into the community, trying to promote voter registration as well as poll official recruitment. So we're constantly on the ground running, providing these updates as they come in. And trust me when I tell you, I have a supervisor that stays on top of me um, about that. So um, I make sure that I provide the community as well as my staff because I'm not always at the outreach events, but I coordinate yeah. most of them. So from our seniors and to our teenagers, just anybody in Gwinnett that needs important information. You know, we, we last year, we had voter registration drives, elementary schools, high schools, as well as Georgia Gwinnett College, where we have a lot of our poll official hiring events. So mm -hmm. that's what we do. So as far as what people are talking about it depends depends what event we're at it depends what type of crowd we have you know mm -hmm. so though that hope hopefully that answers your question but from outreach standpoint we do some we do some of everything and, well and it paul, does paul, yes one thing, one thing i want to point out too that the cream just said there's local you know I, one of the things that i always talk about you, you i think you've asked about how can people have confidence in elections and how do they how do you get past this national narrative that people talk about sure. what's going on in the state and the national and I, you know I, what i love about elections is it's all open right there mm -hmm. steven you know steven represents one party we've got a bipartisan board that oversees everything mm -hmm. you do at your local elections office these are your your residents your your citizens people that you know are going to the store with you everything mm -hmm. that's run in elections is run at the county level and so i think that that I, I try to tell people that you got to come, you got to bring it back. So mm -hmm. you know, these are your local citizens and your, your fellow, uh, you know, we, we rely on a couple thousand poll workers from Gwinnett County to go out and run these elections. And mm -hmm. so I, I think the more people can think about their elections is I love how decentralized our election system is. I think it's really important that every County runs their election. Uh, and so I, I just, I, I think those sorts of things are really important, but like Kareem's folks are out there educating the public every day. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, and I'm seeing a couple of things in chat. Um, okay. I see something from a, a poll manager who needs some students from Georgia Gwinnett College. Okay. We can work on that. Um, Hopefully you have my contact information uh, and it's pgrant at ggc.edu. There's P for Paul and last name Grant. Um, and we can certainly work on that. I know we had some students in the last election volunteer. So be happy to get some more. Um, and I see uh, Diane has included some information as well. So that's great. Well, that's where I was going next. I'm always trying to look out for the students to see what opportunities they might have. Uh, Stephen, were you going to say something? I was, I was just going to ask Kareem if he could speak to the language equity situation because hmm. I think that's a really important thing. That, that is a good point. He's doing. Yeah, so we're in the beginning stage. So bear with us, but I just wanted to Stephen's point. Um, last year, the Board of Commissions made a commitment to increase access to elections and investing in new materials with four different 
four additional languages, Cantonese, Mandarin, Vietnamese, and Korean. So what we're doing right now, we're launching the project. Um, we're translating materials. Currently, we have these volunteers and these groups um, assisting us with outreach events. And so we're like, like I mentioned before, we're in the beginning stages, but we're, we're introducing um, different election material and information for different clusters in Gwinnett County. So it's far, maybe Zach can touch on it a little more, but from an outreach standpoint, we're just working on getting material translated in those four different languages. And like I said, it's the beginning stages. Um, I would say it's a success right now. We have four completed groups. We have four groups um, that have signed up to participate, that are active, that are excited. So again, as we get more information in, as I mentioned before, we'll provide that. But yes, we have launched a language equity project with Gwinnett County as of last year, and it's launched. And we're just trying to move forward and getting as much information provided to these groups and get as much assistance as we can from these groups, um, you know, because everybody's input is important. Yeah, I would say uh, our first big hurdle we hit last last Monday, we got the uh, sample ballots all sample translated ballots. into those languages. So people could go to our website and on our website, the consolidated sample ballot for the county that shows all the races and all the districts for uh, Gwinnett County. It also has all those languages. We have, we have sample ballots in all those languages. And so that was kind of our first big uh, step in this project. So we're really excited about that. But as one important point about all of that though, is that the only language aside from English that shows up on the ballot itself Spanish. is Spanish. That's yes. mandated right. by the law. The actual ballot still English Spanish. Right. Support materials, it, they, they're still not yet on the ballot. Right, and, and, and to Stephen's point, it's the difference between language equity and late language assistance. Um, mm -hmm. By law, um, Spanish was mandated in 2016. Um, for all election day materials to be translated into Spanish. So that's an important point, Steve. It's just part of that process as we're, as we're adding more and more to what, to what we provide. This is really informative. Um, reluctantly, I need to go to kind of a darker place now. Um, before I go there though, I do want to tell uh, Kareem that he has great taste in shirts. <laughs> <laughs> My wife has great taste in shirts. <laughs> yeah, so like, it's like we, we're twins, right? I appreciate um, that. Thank you. No, not a problem. But I did want to ask, you know, as, as, as we have become so polarized and we just really seem to have challenges now with um, safety when people disagree um, around elections, uh, you know, my... In the hometown of my alma mater up in Madison, Wisconsin, there was an event or an, uh, something that happened uh, around uh, kind of political violence. Um, how are you all protecting, and this can go to, to Steve and, and also to, to Zach and Kareem, but what are you guys doing to protect your workers who are uh, trying to make our elections free, fair, safe, inclusive? I'm trying to give you quick answer number one we had a meeting with all the public safety officials about three weeks ago at the office for them to to have an exchange with the board and the staff about uh safety of poll workers and of of the public and interestingly enough uh the behind the scenes the county police are really on top of this they have patrols that are close to all the precincts they're within a couple of minutes normally of being called if there's a 911 type of incident. Uh, the Sheriff's Department uh, provides uh, deputies inconspicuously, but they're on site at uh, early voting centers. They're, they're very sensitive about not trying to look like they're an intimidator, but uh, someone there to protect the public. But they're there to, to react quickly to a situation and uh, I'm just very impressed with the behind the scenes uh, proactive planning that, that the law enforcement folks uh, have done and, and actually have done all along behind, behind the scenes that actually some of us weren't aware of that they were doing. And mm -hmm. they, they did lecture us. I don't mean 
talking down, but they just suggested that going out in buddies at night to a car, assisting people, you know, late at night, that's always a smart thing to do. And just in case there's some crazy out there. And I even think that they were talking about, I don't know if they've followed up with that yet, but having some sort of emergency training with our hmm. folks, the staff about the, to educate others in, in case there's a real emergency. I'm talking about like a crazy with a gun or something like mm -hmm. that. But all of that's in play uh, based on our conversation with the law enforcement community here in Gwinnett County. Well, that's encouraging to hear. Um, did, did anyone from the department want to add? No, that. I think I think you get it. I That's think pretty it's, thorough. Yeah, we 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 found out a lot. There's a lot of things in place. Like like Stephen said, we do have uh, sheriff's deputies are at our are, that are located at all the advanced in person, uh, lo the eleven locations throughout the the voting period, and you know what have police are, you know, doing a lot of preparation for election day, and so you know we're pretty excited about you know I, I think we feel good about where we're at security-wise and being prepared for the upcoming election. Okay. Well, we're, we're about at the end of our hour. It has gone by so quickly and it's been so informative. I, I do want to end, I guess, by asking each of you to kind of briefly respond to um, what are your concerns and hopes regarding the next two elections as Georgia and especially Metro Atlanta and particularly Gwinnett uh, will continue to be the focus nationally of um, American politics. So any concerns and hopes from each of you? Zach, since you're there, you can start. Yeah, I mean, I'd, like I said, I, I just want people to always be thinking about, you know, their, your, your local residents or who runs your elections, no matter what you read online and all sorts of, you know, just interesting stuff you know it all comes back to you know you could always call the office check in on things i answer i answer questions all the time that people have about processes and what we do and you can always come see it i've given i've given people tours of our warehouse i think it's really important that people are educated and understand that the elections really are locally run and and you can have confidence in in the results whatever they may be uh, you know, as far as just concerns, probably about the next two upcoming elections, I think the hardest task as an election administrator that we have is that a lot of people have left elections in the last two years. I think, um, you know, we've, we've been lucky that the commissioners are really investing in our office, and I think we're up to, we're going to be at 42 employees, I think, full time mm -hmm. uh, by the time we get to election day. And we, wow. I think two, 10 years ago, they were at like, a ten, like 11, I think. So, I mean, it's been a huge growth in our office, but, you know, part of the problem is everybody either kind of the, the environments kind of run people down and run people out of elections. And so we have most of our staff is new uh, and, and there's just a lot of learning going on. That's why I'm glad that we have this primary to kind of really, really start building, you know, the best, the best learning tool is, is to see it in action. And so I think this election is helping I think a lot of our staff that had never run an election before start to get some of that experience. And elections are tough and very complicated processes. So the longer that we can get, you know, just this educational pieces for our, for our internal staff, you know, we're going to get there. Bear with us a little bit, but, you know, okay. we're, we're going to get there and, and we're going to have a successful election here in uh, 2022. Great. Kareem? Um, as far as I don't have many concerns about the upcoming elections. I can um, echo what Zach, Zach was saying about staffing. Um, we have been understaffed for a while. So just now having that time for the preparation for the elections is, is a major accomplishment for, for our office. So I just want I just want us to run a smooth, fair election from the office standpoint. If that's a concern, we can label it a concern. But from our standpoint, I just want to make sure we're doing everything that we can um, to put ourselves in the best position for the citizens of Gwinnett County. 
Um, and that starts with myself and Zach and our other staff members. And, and from a preparation standpoint, you know, COVID-19 hit our office pretty hard as well as other locations. And when we got the new voting equipment in, you know, we were kind of scrambling, but we made it happen right. at that time. So now we have more preparation time to, you know, fix some of the smaller things that we might have could have fixed, you know, back in 2020. So just from my standpoint, having that time for preparation for the elections it's beneficial okay. for us okay appreciate that kareem uh steven i was just going to say number one i'm extremely proud of our staff and of our leadership there i think we've got the best uh, election staff in the state hmm. uh I'm, there may be one or two counties that would try to contest that but i'll go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them uh, mm -hmm. i just feel like that we we've got some excellent dedicated people that are trying to ensure that the right to vote is protected, that everybody that has that right has access to the vote as easily as possible under the law, and that the count is accurate and fair, and, and that hopefully folks get through the process quickly in an efficient manner. So we on the board always judge it. If we're just John Q. Citizen, I want to get up there and get out in 30 minutes if I can. Right. That's sort of our target, whether it's election day or early in-person voting. That doesn't always right. happen. But the mm -hmm. idea is we would like for people to get there and cast their vote and move on with the rest of their day. And uh, I'm just very, very proud of our staff and the hard work and determination they show. And uh, I have uh, very high hopes for a well-run election uh, in November. Thank you, Stephen. Diane? So I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk um, about the voter, um, because I think that that is uh, important. I agree with the, everything that everybody said. I think the, the Gwinnett um, Elections uh, Department and Board of Elections really does a great job of making it happen. But for the voter to know who you vote for, where you vote, when you vote, um, there's a wealth of information. I've dropped two links. Um, specifically into the chat. One is the mvp.sos.ga.gov site. That is the Secretary of State, State's website. Um, and that is a great resource um, of information about what precincts you're in, where your voting location is, et cetera. I also dropped in the Gwinnett um, elections uh, site because that is much more specific to Gwinnett. Um, uh, and it has all kinds of information about um, voting hours and locations and where the drop boxes are and you name it, it, it's there. So those are two great places to start. Um, know that this particular election in May, whereas we refer to it as the primary, which parties select their primary um, uh, who's going to run in the in the November election? There are also some nonpartisan races that are actually going to be decided um, now, and so the judicial races, as well as the school board races, as well as um, some of the uh, board of commissioner races, districts two and four for for commissioner, and all for also for school board. Those those. Um, you know, are being decided. Actually, I guess commissioner is not being decided now. That's a partisan race. Um, but the school board and the judicial races are being decided. So know what's on your ballot because it is a long ballot. Um, I've heard numerous people show up at the polls and say, oh my gosh, I didn't know that there was all of that on there. I wasn't aware of that. Um, so go pull your your uh, sample ballot so that you can actually see what's going to be on and prepare so that you can be well informed about what is on the ballot. When you get into the ballot box, you can make an informed decision and you don't leave it blank because you didn't know it was going to be there. So those are, are my pieces. That's what I hope for. I mean, my concern is that voters are educated about, you know, the process so that they can um, exercise their right to vote because the more people who vote, the more um, the, the people's voice is heard. The, let me go ahead by thanking the panelists for joining us this evening. And, and as I emailed them, on, on, in some cases on very short notice, I really appreciate you being here to inform the public. Um, these elections are so important and informing citizens is 
extremely important. We do need an educated citizenry and knowing how to access the vote is uh, you know, what you all do and you do it so well. Um, again, you're hopefully continuing to make things really boring uh, in Gwinnett County around elections. So let me go ahead and thank uh, Diane Fisher, uh, who is uh, the, is it president or chair? I'm getting these titles mixed up. I, I, I'm the president. <laughs> You're president, president of Gwinnett County League of Women Voters. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Mr. Stephen Day, who is a member uh, of the Gwinnett County Board of Registrations and Elections, uh, and also from the Gwinnett County Board of Voter Registrations and Elections, uh, Director Zachary Manifold and Kareem Briscoe. Uh, and Kareem, I, I forgot your title. I, you, you, you've actually done so well, you've been promoted so many times. I can't, I, I kind of lost track of what was the last one I was supposed to include. So I'm the Outreach and Education Coordinator. Okay. Well, thank you for joining us this evening. Yes, thank you. And, and thank your wife for having good taste on shirts. <laughs> so uh, yeah, th this was a great uh, way to end the, the season uh, for our programs. And I do want to also thank um, the Gwinnett Remembrance Coalition uh, and their members and leadership, as well as the Gwinnett County Public Libraries staff, especially Marion Meyer. And of course, Ron, I'm gonna butcher your French. I have to add this very quickly. They, they combined the political science department at GGC with the foreign languages department. And, uh, and one of the, several of the faculty, of course, are French professors. I promise to do better next, <laughs> next year. Um, help me with the pronunciation one more time, Ron. Go, Gautier. Gautier. Ron Gautier. Thank you very much. And of course, uh, any of our viewers this evening who watch this, virtually later on in recording. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Have a good evening. Good evening. Bye, Bye everybody.